I imagine it's been a bit of a mad few days. If you can just take me back, what, what's the last few days been, been like for you? Well, the last 10 days really has been a bit of a blur. Um, we started the publicity run about 10 days ago and the amount of people that's excited and that said positive things about it and that's been really kind. I mean, there's a review in the papers today and we're up against Margot Robbie and uh, Brad Pitt's billion-dollar American blockbuster. And, you know, Bank of Dave movie from Burnley is holding its own. You know, and you're just thinking, how fabulous is that? Yeah, what is it like being uh, mentioned with, like, Margot Robbie, Brad Pitt, and then your story's gone alongside it? It's crazy. Well, we were talking to Brad Pitt about playing me, but I, I just, I, I think he's too much air. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> we went with Rora. Brilliant. Um, after your busy week, have you got any plans to, like, switch off, from, like, this weekend, or are you just, like, keep going? And, no, uh, it, to be fun? honest, it's just... Because it's just hit number one so quickly. I mean, it, it hit number two in Netflix in 24 hours. It hit number one 72 hours later. It's just unheard of. But I think it's the support, not necessarily just for the movie. It's just the support that, you know, if you put your mind to it, you can do anything. I'm just a lad from Burnley who sells a few buses. You know, I left school at 16, absolutely useless. I was useless, Liam. I had no qualifications whatsoever. And I were on a building site as a builder's labourer on £27.50 a week, which was the YTS. How do you go from that to building the first new high street bank for over 120 years? And that's the story. And if this movie can do anything, what I'd love it to do is inspire others, your, your readers and your viewers. If you're thinking about maybe going for a new job, or maybe they're thinking about getting an upgrade in the job they've got or going for a promotion. Or maybe they're thinking of starting a little business, you know, a cafe or a pub or whatever they want to do. Tomorrow morning, make it happen. Just think, do you know what? If Dave can do it, anybody can. Because I'm useless. I just sell buses. That's what I do, you know. And if I can do it, anybody can. Yeah, good for you. Um, has the reaction surprised you or did you expect it, given that Netflix were interested, obviously Hollywood on board, yeah, how have you sort of responded to the reaction? Uh, the reaction's been amazing. But, I mean, two years ago, um, I got the phone call from Hollywood, like you do when you come from Burnley. Yeah. And uh, uh, it, they were out having dinner. And the uh, Piers Ashworth, who's the guy that wrote this script, he wrote uh, Mission Impossible for Tom Cruise. And uh, he was out having dinner with the voiceover guy from the original documentary series, The Bank of Dave. He's out there living there now, doing really well in the voiceover world. And they just made a big movie, a real feel-good movie that done brilliant for the studios. And they were asking the voiceover guy, we saying, do you know anybody out there that's got a good story? And he just said, you better speak to Dave. You know, so he watched my documentaries. Um, he read my books. He looked into me and gave me a call. He said, Dave, I want to make a call about I want to make a movie about your life, you know. And it's like, wow, you better get yourself to Burnley then. <laughs> and you've achieved so much in life, but one thing with this film is you've really put Burnley on the map, regardless of money you've made, people you've helped, you've helped in life. How much does that mean to you to have been able to do that at your hometown? The thing about the money, once you get to a certain amount of the money, you've, you've, you've got all you need. And, you know, once you can pay the bills uh, and, and you can do the things you need to do, Anything after that is just extra. And I think that for me, most wealthy people or successful people, they end up climbing up a tree and hiding from everybody and, and not telling everybody any secrets, you know. And I think, well, if you've already got what you need, why, why do you need to go and hide? Why don't you just tell other people how to do it? And to put Burnley in a really positive light and to try and give advice like I do to businesses, um, I feel like uh, that that's the thing I'm probably most proud of rather than, any of the other achievements that I've got. You know, we've, we, I've made lots and lots of documentaries. I've got BAFTAs and RTSs and broadcast awards and built lots of things. But it's it's when I walk past a cafe that I've helped or I walk past a, a, a business in Burnley. I mean, I went past one the other day and it's a bed business in Burnley that I've helped. And they're there. There's people in there buying a bed, Liam, you know, and you think, we, we made that happen, you know. And that's the thing I'm most proud of. Um, if we can put Burnley on the map for the right reasons rather than the wrong ones, what a fantastic thing to do. Absolutely. And um, just on that kind of point, um, you clearly have such a desire to, to help people. Do you know where that came from? Why that's so important to you? Have you, have you always been like that? Like, yeah. Well, as I was saying, uh, I think it, some of that is 
it's definitely down to once you've got the things you need in life and 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 my family's grown up and, and they've they've both got jobs um one of my children's a frontline police officer other one of my children uh, works in an animal charity and i said to them look you can do anything but not nothing and it's important that you do something that gives back to society and um and and i think something along the same lines for myself and my wife because we're going to spend the rest of the years we've got left however many that is uh, trying to make a difference and we get a real kick out of it you know um I, you know i go into places that we've helped and you know uh bird sanctuaries and things and all these sorts of things that we've helped and, and you think do you know what we've made a difference uh and sometimes they don't even know that we've put money there there's lots of them that don't know um and it, it just gives you a real feel good feeling in the morning um uh, there's a business in Accrington I've just helped open who who got in all sorts of problems in COVID and had nowhere to go. Um, and it's a dog bis- uh, dog biscuit business and and they're open. They're open in Accrington, you know, and it's fantastic. And people say, what's the best time to open the business? Now. It's a bit like planting a tree. The best time would be 30 years ago and it'd be growing and you can sit under shade. But the second best time is today, you know. So if we can inspire others to do the same, that'd be amazing. Just on the point you just made, you mentioned um, your children and they kind of they clearly have their own careers. Um, was it ever tempting to spoil them, um, have them put their feet up, or was it very important to you that they kind of, you know, worked hard and made their own way? It's so important that the children work hard because I've seen lots of people who've, who've become successful on welfare and they've spoiled the kids and the kids have no understanding of money whatsoever. I think it's really important. You know, I'm going to give 99% of my, my wealth away um, at, when, I, when I pass away, whatever day, week, year that is. Hopefully it's a long time away. Uh, I'm going to be doing a lot of it between now and then anyway, but it's all going to go back to society because burdening the next generation of fishwicks or the next 10 generations of fishwicks with enough money to mean that they don't have to get out of bed in the morning, I think it's a really bad thing. You know, you, you need to have a purpose to get up in the morning, Liam. You know, I had three jobs at the beginning and I had nothing. And it's important that 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 you have that work ethic. And I think hard work puts you where some good luck can find you. And my kids don't always agree with that, but <laughs> they are good kids. Um, they're very, I keep them very private, especially uh, frontline police officer because of the, the, the job that they do. Um, and it's it's just, you know, a lot of people say, well, is that not too dangerous job for, for, for your children? No, you can't ro- wrap your kids up in cotton wool. You know, they need to go out there and, and live their life. Um, and it's important. And, you know, sometimes I'm at night and, I, I, you know, I'll get up a bit at night to go to the bathroom for a wee and I'll think, you know, I wonder where they are and I wonder, you know, if they're in trouble or whatever. But I know that they've been brought up properly and it'll be fine. Yeah. Um, we touched on Burnley. Can I ask just your earliest memories growing up there? What uh, Some earliest memories? What are some of the best memories of, yeah, your early days? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if I go right back in time, my earliest memory is really about four or five years old. I'm back straight with my brother, Andrew. Um, and we lived in a two-down two, two down terrace that they knocked down. It was so bad. It only had an outside toilet. You know, I didn't get an inside toilet until I was in my teenager years. You know, I, 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 you know, I always thought you went outside for everything. Um, and we, we had no money. We had absolutely nothing. My dad had two jobs, always worked really hard. And I think that's where my work ethic comes from. Uh, my dad, in the morning... Uh, worked on a farm as a farm labourer from five o'clock in the morning through till about one o'clock in the afternoon. Got all the cows sorted out for a, a local farm. And then he walked down to the local mill in Barrow Ford. Um, and then he'd work in the mill from two till 10 at night as a tackler, which is somebody that fixes looms. My mum was a weaver. So, you know, it, I've always seen a huge work ethic, but we just had no spare money. We didn't go hungry, Liam. We never went hungry, but, you know, we, we didn't have any money spare. So, you know, we'd go out onto the back street where there were cobbles and uh, a bit of tar in between the cobbles and we'd get a, an old piece of glass and we'd get a magnif- magnify the tar and warm it up with the sun and we'd, we'd play with it like plasticine or we'd, we'd go to the tip on Wade's House Road. I still remember where it is. We'd go to the tip on Wade's House Road, me and my brother, and we'd get some old pram wheels and a bit of wood. I mean, my brother's a fantastic joiner today. He really is. Um, and it's probably from them early go-karts. But we'd go on the tip and we'd, we'd get a bit of string and a bit of wood and some old wheels and we'd knock a go-kart together and a bit of rope to steer it. Old and stuff. it would just, that, that's what we did. We, we didn't know any different. And we'd play with kids on back street. And that's, that's what we did. Um, and, and I think 
if you know what it's like to have very little um, and and you then end up in a position where you've got more, you realise that perhaps you can make a net for other people to fall on and try and make a difference to, to one or two other people's lives. And I'll give you an example, a recent one, a really recent one in the last few weeks that we've done at Bank of Dave. A local school, uh, park school at Corner Primary School, I, I got a letter from the headmistress there and she said, Dave, unfortunately, I don't want one of your minibuses, uh, but I do need your help. The kids are coming to school starving. They're really, really hungry. Uh, is there any way that you could buy an industrial toasting machine and a lot of food for them? Um, it's, she said, that'd be brilliant. And I said, no problem. Send me a link, what you need, we'll take care of it. So she did, and we bought all this machinery, and we, we bought a year's supply of food. And I said to them, three months before you run out of food, give us a ring, and we'll get you another year's supply of food. Hmm. And 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 then that's just one of the things that, that, that we've done recently. But if kids are going to school starving, what are we doing in society where you know bankers are coming along for these 30, 40 million pound bonuses again because they're saying to us they need them because they're tired and they're putting all this work in? How can we pay bankers tens of millions of pounds in bonuses again? And kids at a local school around the corner from Bank of Dave and my minibus place are starving. How's that right, Liam? You know. Outrageous. Mentioned, uh, you mentioned school. What were you like in school? Um, am I right in saying you were bullied at one point for having NHS prescription glasses? Is that right? Well, not just NHS prescription glasses. Let me tell you why I was bullied. I was bullied terrible because I was little. I was about four foot nothing. I'm not much bigger now, but I was four foot nothing. I had, a, I had national glasses on with a patch over one eye because I was bog eyed and I had to let my lazy eye uh, fix itself. And then one year it got really bad. I ended up with an ingrowing toenail and it gets worse, Liam. Bear with me. So <laughs> my mum took me, took me to the shutopidist. I went down there and, and they said, look, I'm, so, I'm ever so sorry, Christine. Y your son is, is going to have to have that nail off. So they took it off. It was excruciatingly painful. And they said, look, he's going to have to go to school with sandals on because he can't put any pressure. He can't put his shoes back on. So I were there in winter with sandals on, with national health glasses on, with patch over one eye, four foot tall. Imagine what that were like. You know, it, it were a tough old childhood, let me tell you. If that kid right, who went to school that day could sort of see you now and what you've done with your life, could, would he have been able to believe it? What would he have made of what you've become? Well, as I got to 12 or 13, I learned to fight back. And I, and I learned by fighting back, even though you know I was being punched still, it didn't hurt the same because I'd been punched a million times. And I learned to fight back against the bullies. And I've never been bullied since. And I think that were a really good lesson in early years at school, being knocked about. I wouldn't wish it on anybody, but for me... It made me a more, a more rounded person. Um, I always thought the outside of the classroom window looked an awful lot more interesting than the inside, and that's why I've got absolutely no qualifications whatsoever. Um, but it's not about qualifications, you know. Um, I know a lot of people go to Oxford or Cambridge and all these fancy schools and Eton and whatnot. Well, you know, I come from Burnley, and we don't get them sorts of opportunities up here unless you're incredibly smart. You know, I... My mum and dad needed money, so I had to go onto a building site as soon as I left school. Day after I left school, I were on a building site. We had a bucket of cement in each hand going up ladders for just over £5.50 a day because we needed the money. You know, and I was working at night as well and at weekends. So it, if you've only got one way, <laughs> it's up. When you were on that building site at like 16, whatever it was, um, what did the future look like for you? Did you did you think about the future, what you wanted to go and do? Or is it yeah. day how do you start a business with no money? How do you get going with absolutely nothing? I loved cars, but I didn't have the price of a gallon of petrol, never mind a car. So how do you get going? But if you think outside the box, this is what you do. There's always, always a way. So I went around all the car garages locally, and I said to them, look, have you got an old part exchange that you'll trust me to take away, clean up and sell, and bring you an amount of money back that's been organised now. And I found one on Bath Street in Nelson. And he let me take this old car away. He wanted £70 returning. It was an old Cavalier. And I had the tack, took it home, cleaned it up, worked really hard on it, sold it for 97 quid. Right? I advertised it for 100, not three quid off. Back then, that was a lot of money. So that's £27 profit with my bad Burnley mats. That were a week's wages back then. And I thought, real do. Let's do it again. 
went back up there, paid him, did it again and again and again until I got enough money to be able to negotiate better deals and pay up front. And that led from cars to vans. And then one day I got a minibus offered and I thought to myself, do you know what? I don't want a minibus. I mean, all cars, all vans. No, no, we've only got this bus for sale, Dave. I thought, well, I'll have a go. And sometimes in life, you never know when them opportunities come along. So I thought, I'll have a go. And let me tell you, that were a good thing. Cleaned it up, scrubbed it up, all the 17 seats and everything. Really, really made a good job of it. Advertised it in the Auto Trader. Phone call, 6 a.m. Thursday morning when Auto Trader come out. I'm ringing about the bus. Real do. Another phone call. The bus. The bus. The bus. Jumped out of bed, sold it. All day, phone calls for this minibus. Real do. Eureka. Buses. That was the future. And today, I'm the largest supplier of minibuses in the country. So you never know when them opportunities come. But when they do, Liam, grab them with both hands. Absolutely. You mentioned like your love of cars from early on. That's what, what you drive these days. Now you've had like Ferraris, you've had like really fancy cars. What are you, what are you driving now? Uh, do you know what? If it's got half a tank of diesel, then I'll take it. I've just been to Premier. I've just done a Premier for the Bank of Dave Move It. It's the first Premier ever outside London. First Premier in the north of England ever in global history. I Googled it to check as Burnley had a Premier. Sure, yeah. <laughs> it didn't take long to check. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, I went in a bus because it had half a tank of diesel in it, you yeah. know. Uh, I, these days, I can pretty much have whatever car I want. And I've got some beautiful cars. I'm blessed in so many ways. But like I said earlier, I like to think hard work puts you where some good luck can find you. You know, and I'm, I'm, at the moment, I'm driving a Range Rover, but it, it, I can be in anything. You know, I just if, if there's something at the front of the garage, I'll just jump in it and take it. Um, it, I, it doesn't bother me in the slightest. My grandmother used to say, you know, First class riding is better than second class walking. So, it, it, you know, she'd be pushed in a wheelbarrow, you know. She weren't bothered, my old grandmother. And, and um, there were lots and lots of sayings that she had that really ring true these days. Over the years, like, you're still so humble. What has kept you grounded and down to earth? Any contributing factors to that? Um, yeah, I'm sure a lot of people with, with your wealth could have just went off and been by a beach, did doing their own thing. But what's kept you so grounded? Uh, without a shadow of a doubt, my wife, we've yeah. been together for 28 years. She's far too good for me, she keeps telling me. Uh, <laughs> and when I've been away somewhere, down to a big meeting or a TV event or I'm filming something somewhere and I'll come home and I'll say, oh, I've seen so-and-so and so She'll say, never mind all that nonsense, Dave. Do you want corned beef hash or cottage pie for your tea? <laughs> and it grounds you immediately. She has no interest in money whatsoever. We have a wonderful life. Um, she's not interested in, in 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 going out spending every day or anything. It's, she she's just not like that, and I think that that really keeps me grounded. And brilliant, love that. Um, just touching on movie, um, Dave in the movie loved a bit of karaoke. Is that the same with you? What's kind of your goal to if if that's the case? I love singing, and in the documentaries, I don't know if you've seen the original documentaries, but in the documentaries you'll see me singing a lot in the car. I'm terrible, but I love singing. Um, and it's just, I think it's just a lot of fun that anybody can have a go at, uh, and and they put it into the movie. And I, you know, I, I I love Def Leppard, and what one of the most spectacular days of my life was seeing Def Leppard turn up and all their equipment. They'd flown in specially from America. I mean, the boys are only from Sheffield, but they they, they live in America now, and and they they're, they're doing a global tour that's sold out all over the world. And uh, they took the time to fly in specially and take part in the Bank of Dave movie. And I just thought, that's awesome. And when they come and they got up onto the stage and Rory, who plays me, who, who, who looks more like me than I do, <laughs> he were on the stage and he's singing with, with Def Leppard and I'm in front of it and, and, and I just thought, wow, now we're peaking. Eh? We're not messing about now. Bloody he's marvellous. Yeah, yeah. it's just quite like when putting Bernie on the map and I believe like just off topic but one of the people in the running for, for James Bond is from Burnley um, yeah it's Dave me in Laviscan after the recent spotlight how cool would that be just to have another thing like that a Burnley James Bond listen whatever Burnley can bring to the party would be amazing it's had such a tough time over the decades just to bring a little bit of positiveness and I walked through the town yesterday 
uh, in between meetings and, and you know, the amount of people that just come up to say hello and thank you for, for putting it in a positive light. You know, it, and that's why I did the premiere. And Netflix were brilliant. When I said to them, can we do a premiere? You know, we don't, I said, I, I, I didn't want to do it in Leicester Square. I knew it would be wonderful and glamorous and we'd meet lots of people and whatever, but I weren't that bothered about that. Mm-hmm. I was thinking, well, you know, I want the, the hundreds of people that have been part of the story to be there. And, and I care desperately about them. And I thought a lot of them won't be able to go to Burnley. And a local guy, a local butcher's called Hafners, they made a special bank of day of pie and they put a special um, hot pot pie. And local to Burnley, you've got Burnley Miners, which is a working men's club, uh, very, very, very well known in Burnley. And they've got a Guinness Book of World Record there for selling more Benedictine and art than anywhere else in the country. So we made a special pie and we put a tiny bit of Benedictine and art in it. So the hot pot, Benny, pie, bank of Dave pie, were born. Benny and hot pot, pie. Mm-hmm. And, you know, local butcher made 200 pies and brought them up and everybody got a pie and everybody had the picture took. And Rory come up from London. He was filming a new a new uh, uh, movie. Uh, and he come up specially from London. And Joe come up specially from London. And they spent time with everybody. And we... we, we the mayoress were there, the, the 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 local MPs, the local people, the councillors, the the people that work in the Bank of Dave and, and work in the minibus garage, and, and local people who took part were all there, and all the people I cared about, um, and I just thought it was fabulous. Yeah, how much does it mean to like the people of Burnley? It seems like everyone's enjoying the success. It's for everyone. It's same like um, <laughs> there's an ex James Bond from Burnley. Yeah, how much people are enjoying the spotlight and the positive sort of reaction that they're getting? You know what? I think I think people are just really excited that it's been shown in a positive light. I mean, to get number one on Netflix in seventy-two hours—that's on another level. And when you're up against the new Margot Brad Pitt films, you know we're we're up against billion-dollar films. You know, I we we haven't got that sort of money at Burnley. You know, Burnley Football Club's a fantastic football club, but we, we're just not in the same league as as, as as your Man Uniteds and your and your Chelseas. You know, we we haven't got that sort of money, but we. We bat above as average and we try really hard and, and and it's it's that sort of town where if you put your mind to it, you can achieve anything. And and that's 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 what I'd really like people to take away from this. And you know, there's there's just over one thousand large towns and cities in the UK. And if all those towns and cities had a Burnley savings and loans, all lending like we have, over 30 million pounds into the community, it would make such a difference. Look forward to it. Listen, I can't thank you enough for the time. I know you've done so many interviews, it must be tough to keep repeating the same things but you've been brilliant I really really appreciate it I'm a big fan of the paper I'm a big fan of John Um, John and I have been friends for a long time Um, he's got big connections to Burnley you know anytime at all I can do anything for the Daily Star I'm happy to do it